ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, I warmly welcome you here to Berlin to this, as I think, very important conference about political prisoners in Europe. We all know that the definition of this meaning is not very simple. There are many organizations who have different access to the question of political prisoners. Some call it prisoners of conscience and others. But I think and we think, and this is the intention of all people of all organizations who are responsible for this meeting, that we have to find a way to get free all political prisoners in all countries of Europe, especially in the European Union. But over this, I think, much more important is the question for all member countries of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe, I've been many years a member of the Parliamentary Assembly, is one of the most important players on the field of human rights since its foundation more than 60 years ago. All member countries have to accept and to respect the very, very important uh, Convention of Human Rights that is the basis for all human rights activities of all member countries and that are 47 all over the European country. We all know that in most countries, member countries of the Council of, U of Europe, there are problems. There are problems with fulfilling the ideas of the Convention, with the respect of human rights on the different levels, but we think that every country has the duty to go and to respect and to be checked about these questions. And this is why we are here for a very, very special figure. And I think we have two days of very important debates. And I hope there will be not only this seminar, this meeting, but there will be many follow-ups that we can solve the problems of political prisoners all over the countries of the Council of Europe. This is why I was together with Gerald Klaus and with ESI ready to do this and the concrete reason, of course, to you know is that since some days Azerbaijan now has the presidency of the Council of Europe. And this is uh, for us a very big issue and this is that we have to ask us and especially the colleagues who are engaged in the Council of Europe, what are the conditions for the next six months, what can we demand on the new presidency of Azerbaijan? We just know that some days ago, one of the most popular human rights activists was uh, judged for a, a prison for five years and a half. On the 22nd of May, the, Council, uh, the, the European Human Rights Law Court has decided that the trial against another human rights activist in Azerbaijan was illegal, and these are some bases we have to ask ourselves, what are our demands to the Presidency for the Council of Europe? And therefore, once again, I welcome you very, very warmly here in Berlin, and I hope we will have some very interesting debates, some very interesting decisions, and we can go up in this question that we can say at any time, not so far away in the future, that we have not to ask a, a Europe without political prisoners, but that we can say there is a Europe without political prisoners. And therefore, I thank you very much for coming here. I thank, thank very, very much to Gerald Klaus, who has the burden of organizing this organization here with uh, the European Stability Initiative. And therefore, I'll give you the floor now to say what is going on. And because I don't want to be unpolite, I introduce myself. My name is Gustav Stresser. Since 29th of January this year, I'm Commissioner for Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid in the German Federal Government, and therefore I welcome you once again, and now I give the floor to Gerhard. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Christoph Stresser. I'll get to thanks in a moment. Um, but uh, before I get to the thanks, let me get right into the middle of our subject. Um, let me begin with a, a little video clip that shows, that appeared first online in late 2010, and it shows two young men, two young Europeans, uh, who just spent 16 months in a jail in Azerbaijan, sentenced for hooliganism. 
so in a sense, what I would like with this conference is to begin with the end, or rather with what many of us hoped at the time uh, would be the end. And it is unfortunate that, in fact, we were wrong.
So what we just saw here is in many ways a very familiar story. Nonviolent critics of an authoritarian regime, thugs sent to beat them up one day in a restaurant. Fake charges in the court to put them in prison. An international mobilization on their behalf. An effort to shame the regime that put such critics in jail. And in the end, they are set free. For those who lost 60 months of freedom in jail, there will always, this will always remain a sad story. And it will always remain bitter memories for friends, relatives and compatriots who were supposed to be intimidated. But in a strange way, this particular story is also reassuring. Because our mechanisms worked. Shaming worked. It is clear what is right and wrong. And in the end, right prevailed. In 1961, an article appeared in the London Observer. It launched a movement that has transformed the world. And that is still with us, the International Human Rights Movement. In this article, the author argued that there is a growing tendency across the world to disguise the real reasons upon which non-conformists are put in jail. And he wrote that this indicates that governments are by no means indifferent to the pressure of outside opinion. And that when opinion is concentrated on one weak spot, it can sometimes succeed in making a government relent. Now the morality behind that article and this campaign which it launched was that every individual comes. The strategy was to make individuals known, to shame regimes. And its symbol became a lit candle and the organization that grew out of this, which obtained the Nobel Peace Prize 15 years later, of course, was Amnesty International. In the 1970s, we entered the age of dissent, the age of Soviet and Central European dissidents. It was also the age of the Helsinki Final Act of Human Rights, about which the US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger famously said, its human rights provisions might as well be written in Swahili for all I care. He was a realist. What did these words on paper really mean? But dissidents and Helsinki watch groups disagreed. They were created all across the Soviet Union and Central Europe. Charter 77, Václav Havel, a playwright, took the lead. And so new words appeared. Non-violence, resistance, living in truth, the power of the powerless. Helsinki watch groups led to Human Rights Watch. And one of its founders, explain that it is necessary to also challenge those who indirectly support human rights abuse, to mobilize against the financial, political, and military backing, to focus on what he called the surrogate villains. And so a movement grew. Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Reporters Without Borders, we've just seen the list, and many more. And today we have more human rights groups than ever, more conventions than ever, more human rights commissioners than ever. And we have the story of a great success, as Václav Havel himself put it later, the story of stubborn men who knock their head against the wall, and then the wall falls, and these men are crowned kings. It is the fairy tale story of the end of the Iron Curtain, when this man, released from prison in January 1989, becomes president in December, and others, Arpad Gönz in Hungary, Bronislav Geremek in Poland, and of course the story of Nelson Mandela, political prisoners who leave prison to become moral leaders in the transition in their countries. But here is the problem. Never trust in progress to be irreversible. The Inquisition was abolished centuries ago. So was torture. So was slavery. But they all came back in the 20th century, in Europe, in this city. And across town, there are museums, the topography of terror, museums to the wall, museums to communist repression. Nothing can ever be taken for granted. And so now, in the 21st century, we see the return of political prisoners back in Europe. Amnesty International counts today around 40 prisoners of conscience in Europe. Almost half of them are in one country in Azerbaijan then in Belarus, then in Russia, until recently in Ukraine. The problem has been spreading. 
George Orwell wrote in 1984 about the dangers of totalitarian language abuse, of capturing the vocabulary of human rights. He said that in the year 2050, we might all live in Oceania, and the language of Oceania will be newspeak, where autocracy will be democracy and democracy autocracy, where black is white and white is black, where stolen elections and free and fair elections mean the same thing, where political prisoners are criminals and dissidents are hooligans. Well, this is actually what happened, this capture of language, at the beginning of last year in Strasbourg. The Council of Europe, one of the most respected institutions in the defense of human rights, set up on the foundation of the European Convention of Human Rights, had a vote. And this was the result, 125 to 79. It was a historic vote. Never in the history of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe have more people turned up to vote. So what was it that mobilized everybody to come? Well, it was to defeat this resolution. As there is a resolution drafted by the rapporteur of political prisoners, this of Stresser, who is here with us. A resolution which outlined these things, review old cases, ensure there are no new cases of political prisoners, refrain from prosecuting participants in peaceful demonstrations, refrain from criminalizing the expression of political and religious views. Why would anybody, why would an institution created as a spiritual union of democracies reject such a resolution? <coughs> But first, who defeated it? Here is a breakdown. All 18 Russian members turned up and voted against this resolution. All 10 Turks, all 9 Spaniards, all 9 Italians, a majority of Ukrainians from Yanukovych is part of the regions, and a majority from the United Kingdom, all from the Conservative Party, and from France. Those who lost and who voted for this resolution were all 11 German members, all 6 Swedes, all members of the Baltic states, most Swiss, Finns, and Norwegians. Why? I won't go into it here. We wrote a report on this, which you can find on the website. Let me talk here rather about the what followed after. The first reaction was by the Azerbaijani head of the delegation to that assembly. This is what he said. The rapporteur, Mr. Stresser, has to accept that the Council of Europe belongs to Azerbaijan and not to him. What followed was a wave of arrests. Not all votes in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe have consequences. This one did. From March onwards, there was a wave of arrests like this one of Rashadat, Akunov, a youth activist, and many others. But what was interesting was from now on, these arrests were carried out without any sense of shame. The prisoner carousel where people would be arrested and then released when there was enough pressure, as in the case of Emin Milian Adnan Hachizade, who we had at the very beginning. This prisoner carousel stopped turning. In fact, now people were arrested and sentenced no longer to two years, but to five, six, eight years in prison. And it also, the focus changed of who was targeted. The regime in Azerbaijan no longer cared about arresting people who actually worked for the Council of Europe. Look at these two individuals. Ilga Mamadov, an opposition politician, was also the head of the School of Politics, a Council of Europe project to promote democracy. By arresting him, a few weeks after this resolution was defeated, the regime sent a very strong signal of what it meant that the Council of Europe now belongs to Azerbaijan. And in the same year, Anna Mamadli, the most respected independent election observer, was also arrested. He had been, and this really put the finger in the eye of the Council of Europe, he had also been an advisor to Mr. Stresser on the resolution of political prisoners. How more can you show that you are beyond being shamed, that you no longer care about being uh, regarded as dishonorable, than arresting and sentencing to long prison sentences since the very people who in your country had worked for the Council of Europe? Well, what has happened since to shaming? Let me show you one more clip.
second question. Last time you were here in Brussels, you said that there are no political prisoners in Azerbaijan. Uh, Mr. Bonado and Mr. Bonagli are still in jail. Do you still maintain that this is the fact that you don't have political prisoners? Thanks. Yes, of course, uh, and this also is confirmed by the decisions of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Last December there was a broad discussion in the Council of Europe about this issue and the resolution which was uh, launched by some members of the Assembly with respect to the issue of political prisoners in Azerbaijan failed. The majority of the Assembly did not support that resolution. And actually that means that what I said last time here at the European Commission that there are no political prisoners in Azerbaijan is also confirmed by one of the most important uh, institutions of, uh, of Europe and of the world. Azerbaijan is a member of the Council of Europe for more than 10 years. We are members of the European Court of Human Rights and a priori there cannot be political prisoners in our country. If somebody is uh, uh, treated in a not a fair way, there is always a chance to apply to the European Court and we are complying with the decisions of the European Court. And also I'd like to say that uh, uh, there are no definitions of political prisoners. We think that the definition of uh, political prisoners, if adopted by the European Parliament or by the Council of Europe, would be a good idea. Then it would be very easy to identify who is political prisoner so I say I think that the best answer to your question is the decision of Parliament Assembly of the Council of Europe, January 2013. Second question. Last time you were here in Brussels, you said that there are no political. So. So here you have a president of a country that no longer fears that it would be dishonorable to arrest the very people that had actually worked for the organization that Azerbaijan now took over the championship. But what we've also seen here is that this is not about Azerbaijan, uh, perhaps unimportant for most of us country somewhere in the Caucasus. It is really about capturing our language and our institutions. If these are the standards, if there can be no political prisoners in Europe, if the term itself has no meaning, then uh, what is the use of all the commissioners and human rights groups? What can we, the NGOs and civil society, do to shame anybody? So here, instead of helping, one of the most respected human rights bodies in Europe has actually become a shield behind which a regime has been carried out its policy of repression. Well, here is what happens when you're beyond shame. A few weeks ago in Vienna, in the Hofburg, the Azerbaijani foreign minister presented the priorities of his presidency at the very moment in which some of these human rights defenders were sentenced to between six and eight years in jail in trumped up fake court proceedings. The foreign minister talked about the priorities of the Azerbaijani presidency of the Council of Europe in the following terms. Seminars on human rights education in Baku. Seminars on youth. Seminars on independence of the judiciary. And there will be delegates traveling there there will be speeches, and they will be staying in hotels close to the members of the regime. And they will be talking. And in the meantime, the real human rights defenders will languish in jail. The regime bets that these are just all complicated names in a faraway country. That we will forget these leader activists, the eight young men who have just recently been sentenced. And the regime has, until now, uh, succeeded. Now, here is what we try to do today and tomorrow. We try to launch what uh, in ESI we call the BHAG, a big, hairy, ambitious goal. We need to mobilize. I think the human rights organizations and Democrats in all countries cannot allow this capture of vocabulary. And so we mobilize for a Europe without political prisoners to launch a campaign. We have some concrete ideas which are back there, which we hope to discuss. But the most important, of course, is the decision, first of all, that we actually think there is this crisis now let me start, uh, let me close with some thanks. Thanks first of all, of course, to Mr. Stresser, not only for helping us put this together, this event, but beyond that, for having thought that there is actually today a resolution on political prisoners, which was adopted in the Parliamentary Assembly, and which only hasn't yet been put to use. 
Um, he won that vote in October 2012, and for us, he's been an inspiration. So, thanks a lot, Mr. Stress, for this. <laughs> and also to thank the many human rights defenders who've come here, too many to name individually, to thank our partners from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, and finally, to thank all those who cannot be here, who've defended our values and defended our values in Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and Azerbaijan. Let's hope that they hear what we are saying here. And let's hope that what we say and do will make a difference to them. And so I conclude with a quote from the courtroom speech of the youth organization NIDA, these eight young people. And they actually put themselves consciously in May this year in court after weeks of hunger strike and about to be sentenced to six to eight years in jail. They put themselves in a proud tradition that they wanted to remind everyone of, the tradition of traditional descent. They quoted Solzhenitsyn, and they said Solzhenitsyn and his live not by lies wrote about the despotic regime's dependence on everyone's participation in the lies. He wrote that the simplest and most accessible key to our self-neglected liberation lies right here, personal non-participation in lies. And this is what Nida does. Well, let's make sure that our organizations and our representatives and our societies don't participate in lies either and help to make the vision of a Europe about political prisoners come true before too long. Thanks a lot. Let's start with the first panel. first panel, which is called Human Rights Defenders and Democrats in East and West, What Support is Needed. I am Jana Zavano, I'm an analyst with the European Stability Initiative, and today we have four excellent speakers, guests from Azerbaijan, from Russia, and from the UK. They will share with us their personal, personal first-hand experiences of activism, of human rights defense in their countries of analyzing authoritarian governments. But the key question that we'll try to answer today is why should we, why should Europeans care about these issues and what can be done today? Okay, before we start our presentations, let me say a few words about each of the participants. We have Turgut Gambar, who is uh, one of the founders of NIDA, of this youth civic movement, whose members were just sentenced to this very long term, less than a month ago. And Turkut was very active in campaigning for the release of Adnan and Amin in this video that we just saw. Then we have Amin Mini, who is a former political prisoner, who is currently managing Maidan TV. It's an independent online TV channel that he established last year. And this channel tries to provide an alternative viewpoint to, yeah, to the state control of Azerbaijani media. And then we have Dmitry Makarov from Russia, who is a well-known human rights defender. He is um, the co-chair of the largest youth human rights organizations in the region. And he focuses in particular on freedom of assembly and freedom of association. Recently, he traveled to Crimea on a human rights field mission. And finally, Ben Judah from the UK. He is a writer and a journalist. He is the author of an acclaimed book on Putin's Russia, The Fragile Empire. He has reported extensively in Georgia, in, Kazakh, in Kyrgyzstan, and many other post-Soviet countries. And he's been very critical of the West's weak response to Russia's actions in the recent Ukraine crisis. Okay, and then we can um, start with Tugut. Thanks a lot, Yana. Uh, Yana just introduced me, so uh, I'll just start. Uh, the presentation file, the, the previous presentation was pretty good just to show uh, what is happening uh, in Europe with regards to political prisoners in general and in Azerbaijan in particular. Uh, there are different uh, views of 
not many exactly political prisoners in Azerbaijan, but we can, we can be sure that there is around, somewhere around 100, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, but, but the most important point that there are so many political prisoners and their number is uh, continues to grow, especially after, the, uh, after January of 2015, after, uh, after the resolution of Mr. Strasser was voting against the Council of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, neither activists, uh, eight of them were arrested in, in March and April of 2013 after uh, protesting against the deaths of the conscripts in the army, uh, not non combatant deaths. And uh, this for me in particular and for me that in general this was a experience of how to work, uh, how to campaign for political prisoners, what things need to be done, and, uh, what are the things which are, which, are, uh, which we miss, which we need support in. Uh, I'll try to be as short and concise as possible and to talk with uh, good points. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we've been facing is uh, obviously uh, the financial side of the situation because there's so few lawyers who are ready to take on political cases and who are uh, going to protect political prisoners. And all of them are working pro bono. They're not getting any money, they're not getting any, uh, any financial uh, support for us for uh, representing our members in the courts. I and mean, sometimes they just put, giving their own money to. To the guys and, and just to support them. Uh, the same goes for the families. Uh, it might it might sound very you know very uh, as a simple thing, but prison visits, just to uh, going to the prison every week by the families and uh, bring them the, bring them the food, bring them the medicine, bring them the clothes. It's, a, uh, it's the thing that takes uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of finances. Is a thing that needs to be addressed. The second issue, very important issue, is media support. In the case of Emin and Adnan, we, we were able to uh, gather a lot of media support. During recent arrests, uh, during recent, with respect to recent cases, be it the case of Uber Mamedov and Tofik Yagubu or Amar Mamadi or either case, the same attention, we weren't able to gain the same, same attention. I don't know the exact reasons, but uh, for sure this issue needs to be addressed as well. And, uh, uh, it's very important in a sense of support to the political prisoners as well. It's like every time we talk with them on the phone or personally or during the court meetings, they always ask about the international attention, what is being written about them, and uh, every single article or uh, footage on international TV. An international media outlet is, is very important moral support for them and uh, this issue needs to be addressed in some way and the uh, international media needs to be uh, needs to needs to give more attention to the to the issue of covering uh, political prisoners problem. The third important point is uh, how Council of Europe has lost its lost its credibility, lost its Status as a human rights champion in Europe uh, as a victim of uh, caviar diplomacy, as was mentioned in the previous uh, in the previous presentation, and uh, it just doesn't look the situation is going to change anytime soon because uh, the way uh, the the balance of powers in the Council of Europe is currently uh, being held, uh, not much has changed since since January of 2014, uh, but. The issue, the fact that Azerbaijan is currently chairman of the uh, Minister of Council of Ministers and the Council of Europe, uh, is, a, is a chance to move things forward. Is a chance to is a chance to bring the Azerbaijani government to more international exposure, to more media attention, to more uh, to more criticism. This has worked before during the. During the Eurovision, as you know, in 2012, as some of you may know, 
in 2012, uh, Sing for Democracy campaign was launched prior to the Eurovision, which was held in, in Baku, and it was it was a, it was a great chance to gather a lot of international media attention. This chance was taken, and uh, in fact, I think this campaign was successful. The same can be done uh, and should be done with regards to the, the chairmanship of uh, Azerbaijan and. The same international attention should be given to this country again. And uh, lastly, I would like to uh, make a point about the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, for me, as a person who has done his master's on uh, human rights, European Court is a is a is a structure which which is supposed to uh, deal with issues of uh, sophisticated nature. Where a thorough debate on various issues is necessary. But in the case of political prisoners, everything is so clear. Like the cases of political prisoners are a uh, case of blatant violation of human rights and, uh, and it's strong that uh, so many years are taken are, are needed to uh, address these cases in the European Court of Human Rights. I know about the procedures, I know that it uh, has its own uh, guidelines and it takes a lot of time, but either there should be a different approach to, to political cases in the European Court of Human Rights or completely new body should be, uh, should be established within, uh, among, uh, within European institutions and uh, the countries uh, are, uh, should be pushed to uh, comply to the, to the judgments of this new institution as they do with the issue of European Court of Human Rights. So for the start, these are the main remarks I would like to make uh, later. I think my colleagues are going to uh, say, say things about the issue of political prisoners as well, and then we'll get the questions Thank you. Thank you, Turgut. Thank you especially for reminding us uh, about the aspect that is often overlooked about the financial side of the issue that actually it's not only political prisoners who need support, but also their lawyers. I mean, just to give you some examples from Azerbaijan, in 2011, three lawyers who defended opposition figures were disbarred. Another one was accused of some fake charges and then jailed for eight years. Yet another one was arrested in Istanbul as he was returning from an OSCE conference. So it's a dangerous business to, be, to defend opposition figures. And as well, of course, the families who, as we know, the families of this young eight Nida men are in very dire financial circumstances right now, and they do need support as well. Uh, so our next speaker is Amin Mili, who is a former political prisoner himself. And I mean, it's been four years approximately since you've been free, so to say. Do you think it's different, the situation now? And also, since we're managing this independent TV channel, Made on TV, what are your ideas about what can be done today in the situation that we have now? Thank you very much for inviting me and having this opportunity to, to share my thoughts about uh, specifically what can be done about the problem of political prisoners in Europe. Um, you know, we were talking about mobilizing public opinion. Europe uh, and maybe in the world uh, about this problem. Uh, I think we have, in a way, to thank Mr. Putin because uh, he has done in uh, recent months such an amazing work in mobilizing uh, international media attention, international public attention on issues that many activists, human rights defenders, have been talking for years and years, but unfortunately they were ignored. Uh, other people who were talking about economic engagement of countries, authoritarian countries like Russia and Azerbaijan, about understanding of Putin, they have been uh, respected, they have been listened to, and today we have the result. We have, uh, 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 I would say, uh, another fascist country, uh, on the eastern flank of Europe, uh, uh, re-emerging. And for me, I don't put here any difference between uh, Putin or Aliyev or Lukashenko. These are people of the same religion. Uh, they are preaching uh, the very same uh, values,
values, they are talking the same language. If you watch Russian television or if you watch Azerbaijan state television, it's the same propaganda that Europe is full of gays, it is in collapse, it is going to collapse very soon. Uh, it's poor, everyone in Europe are prostitutes and gays and it's going to be the end of the world if we don't save Europe. So now we have a situation, uh, Aliyev, one dictator, is chairman of the Council of Europe. I think any conscious European should feel deeply ashamed when you just realize what is Council of Europe, what sort of history it has, what sort of ideals and values actually it was designed to stand up for and where it is now. And I think Gerald has shown very well, uh, very specifically, uh, all the uh, problems that have to do with this current situation of Azerbaijan being the chairman of the Council of Europe. But uh, look, I am a former political prisoner. I've been in jail once, six months. Another time I was more lucky than our friends. I spent in January, February, just 15 days. It was my second very short imprisonment. And then in March, uh, many of our friends have been jailed and unfortunately they are sentenced now for eight and 10 years. The situation in Azerbaijan is deteriorating with a cosmic speed. Aliyev is feeling more confident when he sees the situation in Turkey and Russia just, uh, you know, he feels the absolute green light uh, in uh, becoming even more authoritarian, even more blunt and more honest uh, in what he does and what he stands for. And so I was thinking always what can be done in this situation. I think that every, um, I looked at the agenda that has been proposed here, it come together, the proposals uh, that we have to help families of political prisoners, very important. We have to help lawyers that help those families, very important. Uh, the uh, appointing new rapporteur of political prisoners, very important. All these issues are important. But for me, um, one very important thing that I'm missing here is um, institutional approach. We have to look at the roots of the problem. Why is it that Putin or Aliyev or Lukashenko or these authoritarian regimes are so strong now that they are chairing, you know, the most respected human rights organizations in Europe? Uh, why is there is still this debate in even in Germany, you know, that actually who is Putin? We have to understand Putin. Very respected people, at least who were respected before, like former German uh, 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 prime ministers, you know. Uh, not one, you know, they they are basically uh, serving these authoritarian regimes. Of course, it's put in some contracts and deals, but these are the threats that are existential threats. We're not just talking about political prisoners in Azerbaijan or in Russia and Ukraine. I think this issue is broader and uh, this is how it should be presented to media because otherwise media, German media or you know, uh, uh, French, British media, or American media, they will never get interested, you know, in who is this one or two prisoners in this or that part of Europe. What is interesting is existential security threat that is there for Europe, because all the issues that Gerald was talking today, and uh, that many human rights defenders organizations have been talking today for so long, have been ignored for so long. So I see solution in institutional approach and I will talk about one specific area. I think there will be many brilliant ideas. Uh, I think uh, after my personal experience, uh, I mean, spending uh, uh, 16 months in jail and losing my father while I was in jail, uh, having my friends uh, in jail who have been sentenced now, have to spend uh, maybe eight, uh, nine, or even more years in jail. Uh, I think that it is not enough just to, you know, highlight the problem at one conference, at one seminar, where all the same people are coming together. It is very important that we can uh, reorganize, regroup, that we can find allies uh, in Europe, uh, in Russia, in Azerbaijan, everyone who shares the same values, and I don't think uh, we are a minority, we are actually still a majority if you take the whole of Europe. 
but we have to mobilize everyone, uh, business, governments, uh, you know, individual students, uh, exactly as part of these people or, or groups uh, have been mobilized in the campaign for my and Adnan's release. Uh, but this is not just enough to demand someone's release. I think the key issue is free and independent media. I absolutely believe that if in the 90s there would be free and independent global media in Russia established within and outside of Russia, you know, when the internet started to march in all this post-Soviet space, if a very sophisticated network, uh, you know, of, with elements of traditional TV channels and social media, uh, bloggers, citizen journalists, would be worked on uh, and would be promoted, if money would be invested in there, if uh, public opinion in, because Gerald was talking about mobilizing public opinion in Europe, and I mean, probably you were talking, as I understand, about uh, uh, democracies, right? But I think it's also very essential, and actually, to look, to look at the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that public opinion in uh, countries like Azerbaijan and Russia, and you know, and also Ukraine was the case, until recently and partly even now, um, is manipulated by huge investments, you know, huge investments that Kremlin puts in media, in propaganda media. So I think there, should, there is, uh, everyone by now realizes, of course, that uh, Europe lost this information war to Putin, but I think now it's time to uh, start doing things in the right way. And uh, I can tell you one small example from Azerbaijan. After I came to Berlin, because I have seen that it is impossible to create infrastructure in Azerbaijan, every NGO is shut down in Azerbaijan, people are jailed, sentenced. So uh, I decided to create infrastructure here in Berlin. And today, within just one year, we have 15 people, with very small resources, we have 15 people working in Berlin and in Azerbaijan, and we have 10,000 views on YouTube daily. You know, I've done it with very, really, very, very small resources. I absolutely believe that there are enough partners, uh, NGOs, uh, journalists, citizen journalists, businesses, rich people, governments, that could do it and should plan it, should start designing a new sort of a media for X, um, uh, Soviet uh, space. Uh, I think it should be first of all in Russia, uh, because look, uh, Putin invests 350 million dollars annually in Russia today, and it gives its results. It's, there is much more money invested in bloggers, in comments, in many other things that are, uh, you know, have impact. You know, I two days ago I was sitting in Berlin and talking with a group of German journalists, nice people having barbecue, drinking beer, and they were telling me that they think that Spiegel is not balanced enough, that uh, it is Russian position is not shown enough there. That where, like this guy didn't know that the whole Russian propaganda about fascism in Ukraine has just been destroyed by the fact that one Jewish candidate had more uh, votes in Ukrainian elections than two fascists. You know, they had together less than 2% of votes in recent Ukrainian election. So these sort of facts, if you think they are known to every ordinary Russian or Azeri, you know, and Russia is still lingua franca in this region, there is a huge need and demand for this. And what we have seen is a constant, you know, decline in investment in civil society, in independent media in that region. And I think now is a high time to rethink the strategy and to get the act together and to start to invest strategically in a very planned manner in independent media in Russian language and in local languages in the post-Soviet era. The last sentence I want to make here about the structure of such a concept. I think we had at some point the CNN era, then there was Al Jazeera era, and I think now this is where we can start in ex-Soviet space we can start a Wikipedia sort of TV network where uh, it will be based in Kiev, but the network itself will be 
functioning, you know, small bits and parts of it all over ex uh, Soviet Union space. And we should involve a lot of citizen journalists, bloggers, because in spite of all the repressions, in spite of all the uh, aggression against individual liberties in these countries, in Azerbaijan, in Russia, in Belarus, in all of in Central Asia, in all of these countries, there are still people who are risking their lives and their freedom for and fight uh, for freedom of speech in these countries, for freedom of media, and for release of political prisoners. So this is uh, my contribution to today's debate. I think that we, while uh, uh, again confirming importance of all the issues that Jorgut was talking about and, and have been listed in this agenda, I think we have to keep in mind that institutional approach in supporting independent media and civil society in these countries is a key to have real results in the years to come. Maybe it will take one, two, five, ten years, but we have to build this up. Because otherwise, it's not that we are anything like democracy or human rights or individual liberties they are spreading in the, you know, in Europe. It's just the opposite. It's a far right. It's fascist. You know, are coming to power and getting more popular even in the Western Europe. Thanks a lot, Emin, for reminding us especially about the role of independent media in counteracting this very strong propaganda that we all encounter in the media space. So now we've heard from our two speakers from Azerbaijan and we can switch to Russia. Dmitry Makarov, who is a human rights defender and has very extensive background on the human rights situation in Russia as well as in other post-Soviet countries. So Dmitry, what do you think are the main problems and what would be some of the good solutions to the situation we have today? I do come from Russia, uh, but I represent an international youth human rights movement, which is a network working throughout the post Soviet space. Uh, and as I speak now, uh, one of our fellow activists and of the network is actually in prison in Belarus, um, getting 10 days, serving 10 days in prison for participating in food not bombs action. Um, and as we speak here today, there are new searches going on in Moscow. In the framework for the Balotnaya case, so called Balotnaya case, uh, cracking down on those who have demonstrated against uh, Putin's uh, immigration back in May 6, 2012. There's been a new wave of searches, a new wave of arrests, uh, adding to a line of people who are uh, in prison already and call on long trial for voicing their dissent against the authoritarian practices in Russia. Uh, and this is the most massive most the largest politically motivated trial uh, going on in Europe today, uh, unfortunately receiving very little attention in the media. And um, as we speak here today, there are two activists from Crimea uh, brought by FSB to Moscow, uh, charged with terrorism, with attempt to, to bomb offices of United Russia in Crimea. They are Ukrainian citizens. Uh, both of them are blamed to be part of the right sector of the new fascist group, while one of them is an anarchist and anti-fascist activist, and another is a movie maker and a director of uh, films. None of them has to do with uh, any nationalist activity, uh, but they are being charged and will face several years in, in prison. While we speak, uh, the courts in, in Moscow have been handing out um, verdicts in cases where, where human rights NGOs have been trying to contest the label of foreign agents that have been tried and have been placed by them on them uh, by the Russian government. Those are NGOs that have uh, have been charged with being engaged in political so-called political activity by the very fact that they, for example, submitted reports to the UN human rights bodies or that they have collected information on how many people have been detained uh, during political rallies. So those are the um, cases that are being developed right now in Belarus, in Russia, um, and uh, those are the cases that we have to deal with. And um, what do those stories tell us about what's going on in Europe?
general. Those stories tell us that there is a constant and determined effort to narrow the space for civil society, to narrow freedom of assembly, to attack freedom of association, to shut down freedom of expression, whether by uh, foreign agents' laws, whether by attempts to criminalize activity of non-registered uh, groups, whether to attempt to criminalize uh, assemblies, and um, whether by attempts to shut down bloggers and internet uh, media outlets. Secondly, it tells us about the fact that human rights defenders uh, and human rights as a concept are under direct attack. Human rights defenders are being imprisoned. Uh, this year, August 4th, will mark actually the, fourth, the third year uh, when Alice Bidatsky, probably the most well known human rights defender in Belarus, will serve in prison uh, on uh, charges brought by the Belarusian government, but by the information that, that they have received from Lithuania and Poland, in fact. Uh, it also tells us that the concept of human rights has been attacked directly in a twisted way using the uh, new Orwellian uh, newspeak language uh, because, uh, um, because the Russian uh, government claims to defend the human rights of Russian speakers in Ukraine, in Crimea, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, while using the language of human rights, by framing the claims into that language, the governments of, of, of that part of the world have actually have been uh, using everything that they have at their disposal to crack down on, on the very concept. Thirdly, um, it tells us about the fact that the international institutions have constantly been failing their mission, uh, that EU members have been largely complacent to the things that are going on in the Council of Europe, as has been showed to you during the previous presentations, that uh, the Council of Europe, the OEC, the very bodies that have been created to safeguard human rights, to promote rule of law, and to um, move, promote um, standards uh, of uh, democracy, have been dominated by politics, have been influenced by caviar diplomacy, and focus more on trade and business than on human rights. And I think it's time to send a message that Europe it's not, does not end at the European Union borders. But Europe includes those countries that are outside of the European Union, including those who may not even want to be part of the European Union. That Europe should be based not on trade and economy, but should be based on common values. And this is what Council of Europe is about. And this is what OEC that has been shaped just as much by human rights movement as it is, has been by the governments is about. And I think there's another lesson that all the stories tell us about, that the human rights movement also has been divided and has been very displaced <coughs> in its response to the recent challenges. Uh, and I mean, um, right now, many of my Ukrainian friends and colleagues, my fellow, fellow human rights defenders, are studying not only the Ukrainian criminal code, but also the Russian criminal code, because those are the charges that will be brought against uh, them, some of them, and against uh, some of my friends and colleagues that are uh, left in Crimea that is now under uh, de facto uh, Russian uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, I think that there is a need to bring, to, to, to respond to the authoritarian international of, um, dictatorships with the new human rights international. And things, problems that are going on uh, with human rights in Belarus uh, are just as much a problem for Russians and Ukrainians as the problems that they have in their own countries. But the problems of Azerbaijan are not only the subject of concern of people from Azerbaijan, but also of those who are uh, working on similar issues in other countries as well. And I think, I mean, a lot has been said already um, in the media and the public discussions about the uh, uh, recent developments in Russia about the Putin regime, uh, which that is becoming more and more authoritarian. But I think it's uh, quite easy to blame, blame uh, Putin himself and on Russia in particular. But I think we, we need to look um, at other issues that have been allowed such things to happen. I think Putin is a Russian phenomenon. 
but Schroeder and Schroeder's vision of politics is a German phenomenon. Front National is a French phenomenon and a European phenomenon. Jobbik is also a European party. And it's no surprise that uh, those parties that I've mentioned have sent their observers to legitimize the so-called referendum in Crimea, for instance, and have been in close alliance with the United Russia uh, and the ruling party in, in Russia. And I think uh, in the, um, one other message that I wanted to uh, voice now in the presentation that opened this panel uh, there was a mention of the uh, Helsinki movement that has helped to shape the human rights landscape of the European continent, that has helped to bring the OEC together to, what, uh, to, uh, you know, to, bring, to pay attention to the uh, human dimension basket of uh, security. Uh, I think it's time to remember that the Helsinki movement has been started in the Soviet Union by the great dissidents that have actually brought a government to live to the things, to the standards that has put on paper. And it is by no coincidence that the first Helsinki movement, Helsinki Group, was actually founded in Moscow by the name of Moscow Helsinki Group. And it is no coincidence that an uh, American Helsinki Group was also founded by the same person that was among the founders of Moscow Helsinki Group, Ludmila Mikhail Alexeyeva who is still one of the most respected human rights activists living today. Uh, American Helsinki Group was the one to become human rights watch later on. And I think it is important to remember that this is history, but it's also important to remember to, to think that we may need a new Helsinki movement, which may be named differently, but should bring together activists from both East and West uh, in a common effort to, to bring back the value of human rights to, to Europe, to bring strength and renewal voice to the international institutions, to remind them of what they have been created for, and to give a new voice to the uh, human rights concept and to the human rights movement. Thank you. your presentation and for giving us an overview of what's happening as we speak, not only in Russia, but also in Belarus, in Crimea, and in other places in the post-Soviet space. Our next speaker is Ben Judah, and Ben, you're probably the person who knows most about Russia, you've traveled to the most remote corners of my country, and you've been very, very critical of how the West has responded to human rights violations in Russia, and your recent op-ed, you actually said that the UK government failed to impose sanctions on Russia and Britain was laundering oligarchs' dirty billions. Do you have ideas for what could be done concretely in the West in the face of the situation we have today? Thank you. Thank you for that very flattering uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to Berlin. I'm really happy to be here because I am like being in powerful capitals. Now, let's take a, a very long step back. Let's imagine ourselves well beyond the year 2024, when Russian historians of the future will look at us in the present. Because future historians will identify the last two years as the decisive ones, the turning point in Russia's post-Soviet history, when Russia moved from an authoritarian state into an autocracy. The decisive month was December 2011, and the decisive day was December 24, 2011. Putin feared his own Maidan, he feared his ouster. Moscow and 100,000 of the best educated Russians demanding change. There was a fragile civil society knitting itself together across the continent of the country. The internet, long left uncensored, was alive in dissent. The middle class wanted to make inputs. Left to themselves, these trends would have pushed Russia forward. But they were not. This is when Putin began his war, his most important war, the war of the state against society. 
Victory for Putin in this war has been simple. Russia must reduce its free space. Russia must suffocate its emerging society. Russia must strangle its emerging politics. And victory for Putin in this war has been achieved through fear. Through fear, Putin has redefined what is acceptable and unacceptable in Russia. One by one, these pieces have fallen into place. Acceptable and unacceptable assembly has been redefined. With illegal protest laws promising crippling fines. Acceptable and unacceptable protest has been redefined. With a terrifying Colombo Square case terrorising random protesters with labour camp sentences and indefinite detention. Acceptable and unacceptable stunts have been redefined. With the Pussy Riot show trial and labour camp sentence. Acceptable and unacceptable activism has been redefined. With show trials crippling the opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Acceptable and unacceptable political funding has been redefined. With the financial backers of Navalny being exiled, hounded, humiliated. Acceptable and unacceptable investigations have been redefined. With the Navalny organisation being decapitated in this way. The pieces have been falling into place. And the Russian opposition called to Berlin to make use of its Brussels. And Berlin did not make use of Brussels. The walls were closing in. Acceptable and unacceptable internet was redefined. With the illegal content registry and newly unlimited powers of surveillance, acceptable and unacceptable media was redefined. With a free online TV station gorged that practically unplugged, acceptable and unacceptable society was redefined. With the NGO law hazing organisations and, shut and shuttering them with threats. In the first year, Kremlin was nervous of its work. Cosmetic concessions were offered. But in the second year, 2013, the Kremlin were pleased. They looked at what was done and they felt satisfied. Acceptable and unacceptable loyalty has been redefined. And a new treason law extending to any form of dissent. This is how we went from the Russia of 2011. Do, do you remember that Russia? I think I vaguely remember it. The Russia of the Scotland, high tech. Medvedev talking about freedom being better than unfreedom to the Russia of today. We're a giant poster hung in the our back with the faces of the traitors painted upon it, the faces of the Democrats. The war between the state and society has ended almost in victory for Putin, and the war has been easily won because society was weak. The state did not need to move beyond crippling warfare. It did not need to break the new society in the They managed to break new society in the courts. Law was turned into a weapon to distract and disable activists. But in central Moscow, that traitor banner still hangs. The Moscovites remember when traitor banners still hung in their capital. This is why Russia's opposition fears a dramatic explosion in the number of physical prisoners in the years ahead. And this is why Russia's opposition has been calling repeatedly to Berlin to make use of Brussels. But this has not come to pass. So let's go back to the historians of the future. What have these historians written? What will these historians perceive in hindsight that we missed? Future Russian historians, especially Democrats, will surely be very anti-Western. Because of people, because of Russia's offshore elite. The textbooks of 2013 will explain in their opening chapters how between 2000 and 2010. They consolidated the form of absolute power with absolute freedom with the long-term consequences of its actions in Russia. This is the offshore movement. The power broker in Russia who rules tyrannically in the East, but puts his wealth, his wife, his son, his daughter in the West. The power broker who has built a system, the moment that he can pillage no more, he can simply flee to the West. Knowing your private jet and your London mansion is always waiting, it changes the way we treat society. Knowing the money is in Austria and in the British Virgin Islands changes you. Knowing this means you do not need really to develop Russia, because you are not trapped in Russia. Like the elites of Britain, France, Germany, generations ago, generations ago, 
who fought to democratize and stabilize a society will lose their assets. If you're part of this offshore elite, you do not need to worry Time about... Time is running out. We want to discuss the matter, not on... As a Sorry, now, see, that's extremely rude. Just just to to if, you're, if you're part of this offshore elite, you do, need, do not need to worry about property rights. You don't have to worry about developing your courts. You don't have to worry about the ch how your children face in that country, because they will grow up abroad. Now let me explain to you how Russian corruption actually works. Russia's elites are not really empire builders, they're asset strippers. Russia's elites are not really patriots, they're plunderers. But where does this money actually go? Russia has seen over 600 billion in illicit capital outflows. In illicit capital outflows. And where is this money headed? The minimum of 40 billion a year Russia itself estimates in illicit outflows. The money doesn't go to China, the money doesn't go to Iran. Yes, the money comes here, the money comes to the European Union. Because the European Union is an alliance of tax havens. Britain, Holland, Austria, Andorra, Mina Leon, Latvia, Cyprus, Monaco, these are the countries where money is laundered by European bankers, by European lawyers, in European states. Malta, Luxembourg, Ireland. Do you get the picture? Does Germany face up to this? That it effectively controls the European Union tax havens? Does Germany realise what this means? That as long as Europe remains a union of tax havens, there is no point in really talking about battling Russia autocracy or Russian corruption with our foreign ministries and human rights funds, because our bankers and our lawyers are enabling Russia's offshore elite, because EU member states are acting as giant washing machines for Russian money. And I think we're better than that, which is why we need to push for a radical answer. Take the principles of the Magnitsky list which are visa, visa sanctions and asset freezes on criminals, and apply them for a new EU mechanism to Russian officials, perhaps officials of other European countries and signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights, who are violating, who are violating, who are violating, these, who are violating these laws. I'm, ESI has proposed a piece of legislation that I'm very excited about, which I'm very excited about, which would see which would establish a panel of former, which would establish a panel of former judges, which would establish a panel of former judges in an organisation funded by specific new member states, to whom NGOs who submit lists of officials it believes are violating, uh, violating fundamental human rights in um, in Russia and in other Eastern European countries, that could then submit a list of proposed banned individuals to the European Council, which has the power. To, which has the power to visa ban the power to visa ban individuals, and this would be the beginning of developing a mechanism where we could attempt to control grants of short I think this is hugely important if we want to be able to face up to the Russian historians of the future to show that we took measures to prevent the pillage of Russia, to prevent the pillage of Russia, and to hold people accountable for doing that. We would hold people accountable for doing that in the West. In the West. Thanks a lot, Ben, for outlining this proposal. Of, just to summarize, a panel of judges who would advise the European Union on whom, on which human rights violators to sanction in the form of visa bans. So. Some of our panel, we heard from two Azerbaijan speakers who stressed that this important media, international media attention is extremely important and actually it's becoming more difficult to obtain for the recent cases of political prisoners, that financial support is crucial for the lawyers, for the families, that independent media is key to giving people access to different opinions, to countering the propaganda which is extremely well financed by authoritarian government as a means figure of $350 million invested in Russia Today yearly shows. And I've heard that these developments with political prisoners are getting only worse in countries like Belarus and now more, rec more recently in Crimea as well. And Ben told us about where the Russian elites hide their money, hide their livelihoods. And we have a proposal, a very concrete proposal for visa bans for a panel that will advise on whom to punish 
uh, in the framework of the EU. So thanks a lot to all the participants. I think the time for our panel is out, and so we can then go to the second panel, which Eric now is So let's uh, continue with our second panel. Uh, we've heard a lot about, I think also very concretely, both, both the situation uh, in the countries we're most concerned about, but also some very concrete proposals. Uh, now we have another very interesting panel of people who again aren't just talking, but doing things. Um, I just quickly introduce who we have on the panel, Michael McNamara, a human rights lawyer and member of the Irish Parliament who's been extremely active on these issues. Um, when we criticize the Council of Europe, it's always important to remember that uh, there are battles ongoing in those institutions and there are those who are fighting to preserve their dignity and honor. And he's been very active in all the debates that we've just mentioned, defending human rights. Khadija Ismailova, um, uh, she has to explain to us what keeps her going because there have been a lot of pressures on her and yet uh, she has not been intimidated. She's the most uh, well-known investigative journalist in uh, Azerbaijan today, and I think uh, one of the stars of investigative journalism in the whole region. Um, she always says she's not an activist, but she's been forced into this role simply by speaking out for basic decency and uh, the conditions that you need to do journalism. Uh, then we have uh, Bill Browder, who has been a businessman in Russia, but is most well-known in the last few years for his support for uh, a campaign on behalf of justice for one of the victims, concrete faces of the deterioration of the situation, a prisoner, Sergei Magminsky, who died in the Russian jail, and he will tell us more about the lessons he's learned and what this tells us about what might work moving forward. And of course, Christoph Stresser needs no introduction, uh, who will then sum up uh, from the point of view, both of uh, somebody who knows the Council of Europe, but also represents the most important uh, government of the big democracies. Uh, in those debates, it was very interesting that while all the Russians voted on one side, in the debates in January 2013, all the Germans voted on the other side. So perhaps there is hope, uh, particularly to discuss these issues here in Berlin, of uh, turning the tables. Well, let's start with Michael McNamara. Perhaps if you want to speak from there, I think the microphone might be better. Or you want to speak? Okay. Just allow me to speak for a second. And firstly, I should say that I didn't ever intend to become a, an activist on the issue of Azerbaijan. Uh, one of my first uh, sessions at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I was brought for lunch with some of my Irish delegations by uh, a couple of Belgian lobbyists. And the issue of Azerbaijan arose, and you know, we were asked, well, would you like to go to Azerbaijan? You know, maybe you'd like to fly through Istanbul and stay in a nice hotel, etc. I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to go to Azerbaijan. I mean, I used to go there a lot in the past. And they said, oh, oh okay, yeah, in what context? And I said, oh, I was a, a human rights officer with the OSCE. And I kind of had the impression that, well, maybe they were less interested in having me to Azerbaijan. And then I said, ah, no, but I still really love to go. You know, it was a country that I felt was somewhat unfairly criticized in the past, maybe relative to other OSCE member states. Um, but of course, if I go, I would like to, uh, to visit some of the, uh, the political prisoners that, that are there. And uh, I'm not sure if we got as far as dessert, but I certainly didn't get as far as visiting Azerbaijan in that particular context. I did, however, go to Azerbaijan just a week and a half ago. The Bureau of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was held there, and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Legal Affairs Committee. And so in that context, I went. Before I went, I wrote to the President uh, requesting permission to visit political prisoners. That didn't happen. I didn't receive a reply. <laughs> really expect one, but I did have the opportunity to engage with the Foreign Minister of Azerbaijan in their parliament, and that was televised by media. It was, all media was supposed to be invited, 
Um, I'm not sure that all media were there, but certainly um, uh, BBC uh, as area service were there and RFE were there. Uh, they did record it and they did broadcast it all the to their limited audience. Um, I don't I doubt very much that his area national television broadcast the, the entirety of the interaction. Uh, but I did uh, point out that Amnesty International, which is very rich of the human rights body, claimed in the day as of which I was in the chairmanship of, of the Committee of Ministers that there were 18, or then 18 um, alleged uh, prisoners of conscience, and also that um, on the day that Christoph Strasser's resolution was voted down by the Parliamentary Assembly, another resolution on the honouring of uh, Azerbaijan's commitments was um, accepted, and that did actually specifically mention uh, political prisoners and called on Azerbaijan to carry out certain acts which it not only had failed to do, but actually had made life a lot more difficult to be more active in political life. To figure out, I suppose, why that happens, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit unrealistic to focus on the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and expect it to be a, a, a beacon of hope in an otherwise dark uh, Europe. Um, because, um, um, sorry, uh, my timer is hands up, I'm leaving it on. Um, because the Treaty of London, which establishes the, the Council of Europe, sets out in Article 25 that there should be a, a, a consultative assembly uh, and that the members shall be um, representatives of each member state. And to a large extent, they act as representatives of their member states. And I think you can't. There's a tendency, I think, among member states to sort of delegate their conscience to international bodies that they can start to get on with the dirty business of, of energy supply while, you know, somebody else can be our conscience. And I don't think that's how, how life works. I mean, one of the previous speakers said that there was a hope in Azerbaijan that it might be regarded as an unimportant country in the offices. But of course it's not. It's, a, it's an important alternative. It's probably the only one of the only alternative energy sources for Western Europe, and the Azeri government, I think, is very well aware of that. I mean, if you look at the, the president of Azerbaijan, the degree, the, the decorations he's received, I mean, maybe this is normal and I'm naive, but I, I don't think that the Irish president, which is another president of the Unimportant country in the of Europe, let's be real, but I don't think that the Irish uh, president has been awarded the Order of the Star of Romania, uh, the or Order of the Honour of Georgia, the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honour of France, the Order of the Merit of the Republic of Poland, uh, the First Class of the Order of Prince Yaroslav the Wise of Ukraine, Gold Medal of the Hellenic Republic from Greece, the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Three Stars of Latvia, the First Class of the Order of the State of the Republic of Turkey, and the Order of Liberty of Ukraine. Because yeah. he wouldn't have been decorated by the um, CIS either, because Ireland is the member of the CIS. But, you know, that's, uh, I think we really have to look at that. I mean, one of the last, one of the most controversial issues regarding the visit to, um, to the Bureau visit to Baku was the fact that, uh, that a French uh, parliamentarian was denied a visa because he had previously visited the Gordon Karabakh. Uh, he had visited the Gordon Karabakh through Armenia rather than, than uh, from Baku. But one of the last things I saw when I left um, Baku uh, was a magazine with a, a photograph of um, a smiling President Ali on the cover beside a smiling President Francois Hollande of France on the cover. And I mean, they are the, the realities that whatever sort of minor um, <coughs> criticisms countries might like to make, I mean, the reality is that to a large extent, I think countries attitudes are determined by how they, they trade in the same way that, that, that people can be can be members of or subscribers to all sorts of uh, ecological movements, human rights movements, but at the end of the day their power is as consumers in, in their local supermarkets or markets. And I mean if you just look at um, if, if you look at some recent press releases, um, uh, Etar Tass reporting that Azerbaijan and France have signed seven documents on cooperation in transport, energy, agriculture, science, gender, gender policy, and education. So that was in, in, in May. Um, you know, one of the first, that first actually country that uh, President Ali visited after his recent, uh, well, relatively 
controversial election in uh, in October 2013 was Turkey. And this weekend, there are media reports of major trade meetings between Turkey and Azerbaijan, increasing the Turkish share of the Shadanese offshore gas field and the South Caucasus pipeline from 9 to 19 percent. Um, you know, the same is true of Britain. I mean, it's uh, Britain's. Uh, this information is, is from the Azeri Foreign Ministry rather than the British Foreign Office, but at the same time, it does list a recent high-level visit of President Aliyev to Britain uh, in August 2012 uh, during the Olympics, and um, talks about the economic cooperation, especially in the energy sector between the two countries, is a core of bilateral relations between the Republic of Azerbaijan and the United Kingdom. Um, you know, the same is true across the board, and it's not just major powers like Germany, uh, France, and the United Kingdom, it's also minor non aligned countries, or relatively minor non aligned countries, and calling Ireland a minor non aligned country. Uh, I'm not calling Finland a minor non aligned country, it's a major non aligned country, as is Austria. Uh, but they're also in the process of concluding uh, bilateral trade deals with Azerbaijan. So <coughs> I suppose what I'm saying is that you can't expect, I mean, foreign ministries of those countries are, are, are I led to believe, lobbying their own members. Assembly. And obviously they're not lobbying their ambassadors who act and sit in the Council of Ministers, they're directing them. Um, and they're directing them to act in the interests of their capitals. So it's a little unrealistic. I mean, I, I welcome a lot of what's being proposed, this case watch course is great. I mean, it's, it, it's I think, the um, economy's my, it's my stopwatch stuff working. I just don't want to go over to it. So I think what I'm saying is that it's in, it, we should, of course, focus on the parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, we should of course. So when I was in Azerbaijan, I was largely stonewalled on the issue of political prisoners by the foreign minister, um, including the fact that that day the European Court of Human Rights attempted on this judgment. But he did acknowledge that they were involved in lobbying and that they didn't invent lobbying and that they were carrying it out. There is extensive lobbying with the parliamentary assembly. I'm not seeking in any way to, uh, to excuse it or condone it. I think it's appalling. I mean, I think people should have the integrity of public office. Of course I do. But it's not just lobbying, it's also direction from their own capitals that affect how uh, our materials go there. Well, when when Khadija puts up her presentation on the computer, uh, I think it's very important, these points that you just made, that in the end, of course, uh, in the Council of Europe, one of the most egregious failures has been in the Committee of Ministers. I mean, in the end, there we have representatives of the member states. So we have these 47 member states, many of whom are democracies. And in Vienna, a few months, uh, a few weeks ago, when Azerbaijan presented its priorities for the chairmanship, uh, at the very moment when there were these human rights uh, violations and sentences, uh, no uh, member of the Committee of Ministers raised their voice. And of course, in the past, it was possible for members of the Committee of Ministers to do that. There were countries that, for example, took Greece to court. Uh, when Greece became a dictatorship, there were countries that took Turkey to court. But the Committee of Ministers, the member states that Michael pointed to, uh, have not done anything. So one of the lobbies, one of the advocacy efforts must, of course, also be directed at them. Well, Khadija, you've set up. Um, what uh, do you recommend? Yeah. Hi, my name is Khadija Ismailova. I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, I do investigate fortune of my president and his family. And uh, I discovered several uh, offshore companies in Panama through which they hide their business interests in Azerbaijan and in other countries. And um, uh, together with my colleagues, we also found where they invest their money. Uh, their m money. It's British Virgin Islands, off different offshores, and Europe, uh, Dubai and Europe. Uh, in Czech Republic, for example, the president's daughter and father-in-law has a lot of uh, uh, had uh, multi-million property. Next story that will come will be about the multi-million property in United Kingdom of the president's family. Basically, uh, we've been uh, we have to admit that the, the presidents of the post-Soviet countries, uh, for example. Mr. Putin, Mr. Aliyev, Mr. Nazarbayev, even Mr. Lukashenko, they have more money than Angela Merkel, than, uh, than uh, well, they, all, all the presidents of 
uh, of uh, Western, uh, Western Europe altogether. And uh, actually, this is a uh, this is a source. This is for some reason it's not a sort of source of uh, shame for them. It's a source of pride. And I personally have been witness of one uh, pair of uh, our oligarchs speaking about his experience of bribing a policeman in London. And uh, he's been saying that, what are you talking about? Like Europe? I, uh, I can tell you how I bribe the policeman in, in London. They do take bribes. And I wonder if their fathers also share their experience of bribing European politicians in the Council of Europe and, and uh, basically uh, having these uh, anecdotes of uh, bribing European politicians. I don't know if they share those stories among each other and if that's a uh, that's a fun story for them. Uh, but uh, I want to thank the politicians here for uh, proving that not everyone can be good. And uh, that's, thank you for, uh, thank you for this. Thank you for uh, letting us to tell the story of Europe, which you cannot buy. Uh, because uh, this is the this is the this is uh, this story is is more and more difficult to say in Azerbaijan. Uh, why I brought this picture? Uh, I don't know how many of you know about uh, the tale of uh, Alexander Sergeyevich of Pushkin uh, on fisherman and goldfish. Goldfish. Basically, the guy catches the fish and fish uh, uh, fish fulfills the three dreams of the of the fisherman. So uh, I don't know whether uh, the fisherman was, uh, who, who was the fisherman and whether the fish was true, but the sea was definitely a Caspian Sea. And when, the, when our pre president came to, uh, came and caught this fish and uh, asked to solve all these problems, fish said, you need just two things. You don't need three things. You need just two things. It's oil and cabin. And uh, so, uh, basically, Caspian Sea provides uh, two main commodities that are being used for uh, for bribing and convincing in Europe. Uh, so, we are talking about political prisoners in Azerbaijan, and I want to share the latest news with you today. The penitentiary system's website posted a letter, the letter you, you can see here, by Bahti al this guy. He's one of the eight Lida prisoners. Uh, these guys uh, are imprisoned, like the, the Nida case is based on their protest actions uh, in January 2014, uh, 13, uh, one year ago. They protested no combat deaths, uh, non-combat mortality in army. Basically, soldiers in Azerbaijani army were dying because of corruption and mismanagement. And these guys staged protests, like mainly eight people, like not this particular guy, but Nida was on the lead of those protests. And what happened next, the government, uh, it was the government suppressed the, uh, uh, the protest actions, there were several of them. Uh, I was also detained in one of those protests and uh, sentenced to uh, pay fine and then street sweeping for, uh, uh, for attending a rally. And, but these guys later were arrested uh, and they were sentenced to six to eight years in prison. And uh, one of them, one of the young and non-leading members of NIDA, now writes a letter saying that while in prison, he found himself, realized that he has been implementing wrong ideas of provocateurs, and he demands from relevant structures not to relate political prisoner notions to him. And last sentence is, I don't mind publication of this letter in mass media. And this letter appeared on the website of the government's penitentiary system. And uh, another letter they claim was sent to the president where he asks for pardon. And he 
things this letter will uh, tell you. Well, this letter is, uh, we collect these letters because it's a literature of oppression uh, and uh, it reminds us the Stalin time. And what, what would make Stalin pale in comparison with Aliyev is this case of Mr. Dashkin Melik Melikov. He's, uh, he's a young activist. Uh, he used to be very active in Facebook. He's one of the Facebook prisoners. He was a member of the uh, Popular Front Party. And uh, he wrote a similar letter, and this is what happened. He was pardoned, and with a convoy, he was brought to the uh, cemetery where Haydar Ali, the father of Ilham Ali, the grave is. And uh, he, that's, that was the price for his freedom. He had to lay flowers to Haydar Ali and his late wife. That was great. So you have to lay flowers to the president's uh, father and mother's graves to get him, uh, free from prison. These are the, uh, this is the youth act. So who, who is getting in prison? These are the youth activists. Why they got in prison? Because they were popular and because they were not controlled. And these, they dared to stage rallies. Uh, after the rallies, the, the government actually had to change the Minister of Defense. Well, it didn't change the system and uh, it didn't uh, help to improve much, but at least there was some attention to the situation in army. And in, in the past year, we had 20 deaths less in the army than in all previous years. So the, uh, the soldier mortality, non combat so soldier mortality was uh, skyrocketing in the past years and it went down last year because the government had to pay attention because, because of these guys' uh, protests, because of protest actions organized by these guys. But the government doesn't like people who, who make them to make changes and these guys uh, were arrested and these are the, the figures here are actually show how, how long are these sentences. Uh, Gerald has uh, told about this case and uh, uh, Turgut was also speaking about this case. And I, I want to uh, reiterate something that Turgut was telling you. It's about the supporters of uh, political prisoners' families. Well, we try to collect every month's money to support the families, uh, including these ones. And in fact, uh, I'm, I, I'm writing about corruption, I criticize corruption, and then family of the political prisoner comes, the mother comes and says, she needs money because she needs to bribe a prison guard to convince him to open the window in summer because her son, who has asthma, needs to breathe to bribe a prison guard to open a window. The window should be open all the time. The, the, that's a prison rule. The, it, there is no prison rule the, that prevents it. But you have to pay for this. It's a privilege in that prison. So these kind of, and I can't say to mother, no, corruption is bad, you shouldn't pay bribes. I can't tell that because pri prison is probably not the best place to uh, uh, to fight corruption instead of when you have an issue of survival. This is another uh, kind of uh, prisoner. He's uh, one of the Facebook prisoners. He's a, Abdul Abil is a young activist. He is imprisoned uh, because he was, he had a very popular page uh, that was called uh, Let's Stop uh, Psychophants. Like Askis, and uh, the the page was popular, and the guy is, was very active, also in crowdsourcing information from the uh, citizen journalists, and he got arrested. And this is what he said in his final speech in the court. He said, "My father, my grandfather, prominent cleric, was arrested in 1937, Stalin's time." Together with the poet Mikhail Mushkin, uh, today the heirs, the grandsons of those who did 
or welcome repressions in Stalin's times want us to live without freedoms like in 1937. So Abdullah Bilal is sentenced to five and a half years for in fake drug charges. I was I attended only one hearing on his case, and he and this is what I heard in that uh, hearing. Policemen who basically uh, there was no proof. The, there was the the, uh, the lawyer, the defense lawyer, was proving that police couldn't make a search in his apartment because they didn't have proper documents. Police claimed that Abilov himself invited police to come to his apartment to do a search and find drugs. This is another ridiculous case. He is uh, also a Facebook prisoner, Omar Mamadov. He is uh, he was an admin of Selected from Us TV page, uh, where they've been mocking the Us TV propaganda of Adidas. And uh, here is what we have from his uh, uh, court trial. We've learned in the court trial that his father and he himself were invited to anti-organized crime unit of Interior Ministry twice before he got arrested, uh, to, and there they've been warned about online activity of, the, of Omar. And then he was arrested on a drug charge. Uh, indictment claims that he was selling drugs in Baku, but they chose the wrong timing for this uh, claim because according to the indictment he was selling drugs in Baku, but according to his passport, Omar Mamadov's passport, he was in Cyprus. Then. And uh, another thing, the witness, and uh, his name is Nurma Ramov, uh, who, who came to the court to tell that uh, he actually saw Omar Mamadov selling drugs, he is the, that's his job, he is witnessing in the court. And uh, it, simultaneously his name appears in several other court trials where he uh, he's serving as a witness, so he's a what we call Stadtni Svidetin. It's a, uh, a, a, a like witness on duty for the person. This is another guy. He's my colleague Abbas Zainali. He got nine years of jail and uh, one year suspension of professional activity on a fake bribery char charge. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of Kural newspaper, and actually he was arrested after fact-checking President Aliyev's interview to Al Jazeera. His story proved that Aliyev was lying in every single sentence of his interview. And then he got arrested, and the claim that he was demanding bribe comes from this woman, she's on the left, with the face to us. Uh, she's Gulara Ahmedova, ruling party MP. She was recently in jail for several months only because, and this is the screenshot from the, uh, it's a still from the video. Uh, in this video, she was demanding one million for appointing someone an MP from ruling party. So she was de negotiating the price of becoming MP, member of parliament in Azerbaijan with the candidate, with the candidate. What happened after? One million manat was given to her. Then she, uh, then the guy was announced a winner in the elections, but the opposition gave all the proofs that he was not elected. And uh, the, in that particular uh, case, basically the government decided that he's not that important, and uh, they dumped him. The election results were um, canceled. I know it. And what happened after? Uh, she didn't return the money, and that's why uh, that's why he decided to release the video after several years of demanding this money. And uh, then she was found guilty uh, for uh, for a fraud, not for uh, the state crime like selling the parliament seats or whatever. For a fraud, she was uh, found guilty, and she spent only several months in prison. Several months. She, her sentence was three years, and she spent not not a full year. Um, so, uh, but I have, and we have these guys, Anar Mamadli and Bashir Suleiman. They uh, they are in jail for uh, reporting election fraud, and uh, 
another Madrid's verdict is five and a half years. So this is uh, the kind of justice we have. I'm going through the. Uh, I'm going through the uh, another investigation, and uh, basically we had. There was there were questions if I will be allowed to leave the country because I'm a with, uh, I'm, I'm being interrogated in the case of revealing the state secrets. And uh, uh, so there are two components in the case. One is my meeting with the U.S. Senate staffers, uh, which uh, the, our government thinks could be, uh, they could be CIA uh, agents. And uh, second is me revealing this document. I posted this on Facebook, and this is, uh, I don't know if that's an authentic document or what. I, and I, when I posted it on Facebook, I wrote that I don't know if it's document or not. It's been sent to me by former employee of the Minister of National Security. He lives in France now, so I, uh, I could tell his name, but he allowed me to name him. Uh, an idea. So he sent me this, this piece of, this file. And this file is the report of the Ministry of National Security employee to his boss, as, like, as it is claimed on the paper. And this, in this report, the guy says that within the plan of controlling opposition, we agreed with this opposition member, opposition party member, that we will pay him 600 uh, manats, which is equal to 600 euros, uh, a month, and he will report to us about <coughs> things in uh, opposition and will create conflicts whenever we will meet. It. And as a, so we agreed that we will pay him for that. And uh, as a mean of additional pressure on him, so just to make sure that he will not uh, sneak out. Uh, we have his video of non-traditional sex with multiple partners. That's what this paper says, and I erase all the names and information that could identify the guy's name, because I don't know if that's a fact, and I don't want to uh, intrude to someone else's privacy, uh, if that's truth. But, well, uh, it didn't stop Azir government when they intruded my privacy and planted a video camera in my bedroom and then blackmailed me with that video. Well, anyways, this was another proof that the, uh, the government of Azerbaijan, the Minister of National Security, was actually using this methods against opposition and critics. Anyways, what happened next? As I said, I was not sure that it's a document. I was not sure that it's an authentic piece of paper. I was not sure, but state prosecutor's office proved that it is. They opened a criminal case on revealing a state secret based on my, me posting this document. So if that's a state secret, it means that it's a document. So this is what happened. Now they, uh, well, after a first interrogation, when I went out, and uh, to the press and said, well, I found out that this is a document that I should send the prosecutor's office for that. Well, uh, after the first interrogation, they understood that they've, they've, they've done something wrong. They shouldn't have opened this criminal case. And it, anyways, it's, it's all over the Well, this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of uh, state secrets our government has. And uh, here is a list of people who are in prison uh, now. And uh, some of these groups are in the lists of political prisoners, which some uh, people in Europe and uh, in Azerbaijan have doubts about. It's human rights act act activists in regions and uh, in, uh, and in uh, the capital. Uh, there are no doubts about that. Politicians, election monitors, bloggers, and we have one group that is being argued a lot about. It's Islamists. Well, I have to say that we do have militant Islamists in prisons, and but our talk is not about them. The list of political prisoners includes several dozens of moderate Islamists. Islamists 
who didn't promote any violence, who did not, who did not uh, uh, say that they want a Sharia state in Azerbaijan, who said that they want their daughters to be able to go to school in their headstops, and they protested for that, peacefully protested for that. And the group that, and the clerics who were popular and not controlled by the Ministry of National Security and some religious groups of the government. So these people actually uh, are the kind of Islamists who would, who would actually be able to promote the moderate Islam in Azerbaijan, non violent but they are in prison, and by, by putting them in jail, the government of Azerbaijan actually made Muslims of the country very angry. And, if, and now there is an ongoing debate, debate in Islamist community of Azerbaijan, whether the moderate ways of Islam they've been promoting was the right thing. Maybe we should go and look for other ways of promoting our Islamism. So by jailing moderate and pro-independence people just for being popular and not controlled by the government, the government actually uh, pushes the religious community to, uh, to seeking for new, more radical ways of, uh, of uh, the... I think my time is out and, uh, well, uh, I, I want to thank you, Mr. McNamara, Mr. Strasser, and uh, other European politicians who help us to prove that Europe is, is about values. It's not just about group politicians. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Khadija. And in fact, the last issue you raised was also very important in the report by Mr. Stresser, who also in his report on alleged or presumed political prisoners included a few of those moderate uh, Islamic activists and of course this was then uh, used by people in the debate in Strasbourg by saying Mr. Stresser is defending terrorists uh, uh, without of course uh, any evidence, but uh, why do you need evidence if you have to vote? Um, now let's go to Bill Browder. Uh, you've been an activist now for uh, some years on the case of Sergei Magnitsky. What have you learned uh, about Europe and about what works in uh, working uh, against political imprisonment and uh, for justice? Thank you, Gerald. Um, I'm kind of an unlikely human rights activist. And as uh, Gerald introduced me before, uh, I was originally a hedge fund manager. Russia, and uh, I, uh, I ended up in this um, field of human rights activism as a result of a, a very heartbreaking story of Sergei Magnitsky. Uh, many of you have heard the name Sergei Magnitsky, probably many of you know the story of Sergei Magnitsky, but for the benefit of those uh, who don't, I just want to briefly summarize uh, what happened to Sergei Magnitsky and how that uh, changed me into an activist and, and how that has led me to a way of dealing with some of these um, infuriating stories that we've heard today so that we have some, some uh, cause of action against the people who do these terrible things. Uh, so I was um, investing in Russia. Uh, I had ran an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund. My fund uh, discovered I discovered massive fraud that was taking place in the companies that I was investing in. Companies that you've heard of, like Gazprom, Sparebank, and Blue Coil. The management of those companies were stealing lots of money. And I thought that that was uh, not fair, that uh, they were stealing all the money. And so I, I looked around to see, well, what can I do to, to stop them from stealing the money in these companies that I own shares in? And I discovered that there was really nothing in the official system that you could do. The Russian um, police don't police, the Russian politicians are corrupt, etc. And so I decided to do the only thing that was in my power to do, which was to figure out how they did the stealing, and then 
to expose it through the international media. And as you might imagine, the people who were stealing money didn't find that too pleasant. And they didn't like me very much. And so after doing this for a few years, I was expelled from Russia in 2005 and was declared a threat to national security. Um, I quickly got all my people out and I got all of our money out because I figured that um, when the Russians go after you, they don't go after you lightly. Uh, and uh, I thought I was done with Russia, but they were just getting started with me. And uh, 18 months later, the police raided my offices in Moscow and raided the offices of my law firm, Firestone Duncan. We actually had Jameson Firestone, who's sitting up here in the white shirt in the second row. We'll probably talk about this more tomorrow. Uh, and the police seized all of the corporate documents of my companies. Um, they were empty at this point, but they didn't know it. Uh, and then the next thing that we discovered uh, was that we no longer owned our companies anymore, and the police had stolen the companies using the documents they seized in the raid. <coughs> at this point, I hired Sergei Magnitsky, who was a 36-year-old lawyer who worked for Jameson Firestone at this law firm to help me investigate. And through a very long and, and um, intensive investigation, he discovered that not only had they stolen my companies, um, but the police had stolen $230 million of taxes that we paid um, to the Russian government. And so they weren't just trying to steal our money, which they didn't succeed in doing, but they were stealing the, the country's own money. The police, together with tax officials and organized criminals, stole $230 million. Sergei Magnitsky discovered this, and as a good patriot of Russia, he decided that he was going to try to uh, get justice for his country for the stolen money. And he, uh, he ended up testifying against the police officers who were involved in the raid uh, that took the documents that were being used. And instead of um, investigating the police officers, um, the same police officers he testified against came to his home about a month later in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then started to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in uh, cells with uh, uh, 14 inmates and only eight beds and let the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no window panes in December in Moscow, uh, uh, where there was no heat, so he nearly froze to death the opposite problem of Azerbaijan. Um, they put him in uh, cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor um, where the sewage would come bubbling up. Uh, and after, after six months of this, uh, he became ill. He lost 20 kilos. He was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones, and he was needing a, a, an operation. But instead of operating on him, they abruptly moved him to a prison without any medical facilities. And at the new prison, they then denied him all medical care, in spite of writing 20 different requests uh, to every different branch of the Russian penal law enforcement and judicial system begging for medical attention. Uh, the, the pain got so, so intense he could barely um, stand. Uh, this didn't go on for just a day or a week. This went on for several months. And finally, on November 16, 2009, his, his body finally gave out. Uh, he went into critical condition on that night. And it was only then that they, uh, they decided to move him back to a, to a prison facility that had a hospital. But when he arrived at the prison with the hospital, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell and eight riot guards with rubber batons came into his cell and beat him for one hour and 18 minutes until he died at the age of 37. That was four years ago. I learned about this on November 17th, the day afterwards. And it was like a, a, a knife that went right into my heart. And I made a vow then and there that I was going to get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been on a quest to get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. Um, Gerald's question was, how do you get justice? What, what, what does one do in these situations? And, and I, 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 as I said, I'm a, I was a trained um, investment manager, not a human rights activist, so I didn't know what you do as a human rights activist. So I went, first thing I did was I went to a friend, who, a friend of a friend who worked at Human Rights Watch, and I said, what do you do in these situations? How do you get justice? And my, uh, 
this, this person at Human Rights Watch you know, offered to be very helpful and sort of started to advise me on a regular basis and told me things like, well, you go to the European uh, Union, you know, the European Mission, and try to get them to bring up the case with the Russians. So I went to Brussels and, and, uh, and they got them to bring up the case with the Russians and the Russians didn't care. And then she said, how about I'm going to uh, the U.S. State Department and get them to uh, put Sergei's name in their annual human rights report. So I went to the State Department and, and they dutifully put Sergei's name in the uh, annual human rights report. And the Russians didn't care. Uh, and I kept on escalating all of these normal tools that, that you're supposed to use as a human rights activist. Getting, in, getting, getting governments to bring it up, putting in reports, and naming names. And the Russians didn't care. Um, why didn't they care? Because it had no consequence. There was no consequence to anybody. So I said to myself, "Well, well what, what can we do that, that, that they would care about?" And um, and the answer was um, that they care about these guys do these crimes often for money. Um, it's all about corruption. Why are all these people being put in prison in Azerbaijan? I think they're being put in prison by, in Azerbaijan because the government doesn't want, want their corruption exposed. Why did Putin invade uh, Ukraine? He didn't invade Ukraine because he cared about Ukraine. He invaded Ukraine to create a distraction because he's one of the most corrupt kleptocrats in the history of the world. These guys care about their money. And what's interesting is that they care about their money, but they don't they care about their money so much they don't keep it in, in Russia. Keep it in the West. And as Ben Judah said earlier, um, it's all here. And so this gave me an idea, which is uh, if these guys keep their money in the West, and we see them travel in the West, and, and you don't have to travel very far in Europe to see rich Russians, then maybe we could take that away from them. And so we came up with this idea of, of imposing visa bans and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. And I went around to various politicians, and, and Mr. Strasser here is one of my, um, one of my uh, collaborators. And I, went, I went to the European Parliament, and I went to, um, uh, I went to the U.S. Congress, and the Canadian Parliament, the British Parliament, and um, I got a lot of people interested in this idea, and um, it got the most traction in the United States, and eventually became known as the Magnitsky Act, named after Sergei Magnitsky. And, um, the first version of the Magnitsky Act was proposed in October of 2010. And it was, the Act said that, that, that the United States government uh, would uh, uh, impose visa bans and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. It was a proposed law. They launched it. And the most interesting thing happened, which was after it was launched, every other victim of human rights abuse in, in Russia that had the opportunity to travel to Washington came to these Senators, Senator McCain and Senator Cardin, and said, "This you figured out the Achilles heel of the Russian regime. This is what they care about: their money and their travel. Can you add the person who killed my brother, my father, my sister, my mother uh, to your Magnitsky list?" And after about ten of these approaches, uh, the senators decided that they had or figured out that they were onto something much bigger than just one case, one tragic case. And they added 65 words to the law to say that not only are they going to sanction the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, but they're going to sanction the people who have committed other gross human rights abuses in Russia. And, um, and this thing took off like wildfire, and it eventually led to a vote at the end of 2012 in which 92 senators voted in favor, four against, and the Magnitsky Act passed the Senate. 89% of the House of Representatives voted in favor of it. President Obama signed it into law in December. And, I, and let me tell you something. This, this is something, this is a piece of legislation that truly terrifies the Russian regime. It terrifies them because it means there's nothing that Putin can do to protect the people who carry out his orders and the orders of his regime in committing gross human rights abuses. When these people do bad stuff, there's a chance that they, those people won't be able to travel again and they'll be sanctioned and their, their assets will be frozen. The idea is not uh, exclusive to Russia anymore. 
the um, uh, same senator, Senator Cardin and McCain, are now working on a, a global Magnitsky Act, which would apply to all countries. It would apply to Azerbaijan, and to Kazakhstan, and to Belarus, and all the uh, places where, where, where people are going to be talking about uh, in this context. And this is the new technology of human rights advocacy. <coughs> it's going after their money and going after their travel. We live in a globalized world now where uh, uh, Khmer Rouge didn't go to San Tropez, but all these guys who are doing this stuff now do, and they want to keep on going to San Tropez. And we now have got leverage to do something to stop them. And so, um, as we all um, brainstorm about what, what needs to be done, we've got a tool, and now it just needs to be implemented further in the United States, and we need to get this tool implemented more, more importantly in Europe, because the people who are doing this traveling a lot more often to San Tropez and to Sardinia and to Malaga and Marbella than they are uh, to anywhere else. And so uh, for anyone who's interested, I'd be glad to share how we all can work together on this. But uh, this is the thing that, that it sends shivers up the spines of uh, corrupt leaders in these countries. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I've uh, heard you recently in Oslo, but it's always a, a pleasure because it gives uh, a sense that things are possible. Uh, of course, uh, we've devoted uh, a lot of time to this, a lot of resources, but uh, if people come together and mobilize together, things are possible. Uh, but it doesn't have to be defeatist. So, this was also the motto, I think, of the work you did in Christoph Stresser did at the Council of Europe. Uh, not to give up. You had four years that special rapporteur for political prisoners. Uh, the mandate was once prolonged. And if we say that the final resolution was, that was defeated, there was a resolution that was not defeated. And in a sense, this whole conference is about that resolution which we got through on political prisoners, gave it a definition, and on the basis of this, hopefully, one can act. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and for the possibility to say some words. I don't want to add more examples for the situation in Azerbaijan and what uh, your brother said for the situation in the, the relationships between Western countries and Russia on behalf of the, the Magnitsky case. I myself would say generally, not um, in this case but in many others, there should be a little bit more courage in the politics of Western countries when they deal with uh, big violations of human rights. This is my first, my first point and because I see uh, that by in, in all debates we have and I think therefore I will make a little bit more than only the, the situation of, of human rights, uh, of, of uh, political prisoners, I feel and I see that in many, many debates in the last Years, not only in the Council of Europe but in the international community, there is a, a, a structure that I feel is very dangerous for the situation of human rights all over the world because some countries are trying to renovate the, the values of human rights that come out of the, for example, of the um, European Human Rights Convention but also the, the General Declaration of Human Rights and the of the United Nations. I have been in, I think it was in March, on the meeting of the Human Rights Committee in uh, Commission in, in Geneva, and I had to listen to the speech of the Russian Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Lama. And what he said was very clear. He said, you, the Western countries, have your idea of human rights, and we, and other countries, have another idea of human rights. We have to respect and to accept different cultures, different traditions, and this is why we don't want a uh, longer time to follow that what you understand under you. And I think this is the real dangerous discussion we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make in the, in, the next, in the next year. I feel if this kind of resignation will win in the debate, in the international debate, the, the idea of the general values of human rights has lost. And this is what we do not, we cannot accept. And there are some examples in the last uh, uh, days, in the last months, and in the last years, not only in Azerbaijan, 
This is what I want to say very, very clearly. Because one of uh, the arguments against my report was you are blaming one country. Because do you not um, try to find out the situation in other countries? Therefore, I think it's a very, very good idea that there is, I think, a motion in the Council of Europe for the next meeting, I don't know when, that there is a, a new uh, special rapporteur for the question of political prisoners in all member states of the Council of Europe. I think this would be a very, very good signal to say it is not only the situation in one country, but we have to look for the situation all, in all member countries of the Council of Europe. I do not know, and this is the second point I wanted to, to say to this topic, uh, if it's possible that one rapporteur can get this in, in his job. I know, myself, I know how small the, the resources are to make such a report. I, have, I was uh, supported in the office in, in um, Strasbourg by two persons and they had not only my report, they had a lot of other reports. And therefore, I feel it's impossible for one rapporteur under the existing structures of the Council of Europe to make such a report. This is what I feel and I think we should discuss it in the structures of the Council of Europe. I feel if we want to take up this topic and I feel it's very, very important there must be another structure, there must be bigger staff, there must be more, more financial uh, output, otherwise the one who will, who will uh, uh, do it, who will get this, this new report, he will have no real chance. This is the, the second we have, I think, to debate tomorrow, there will be the structures to continue uh, this case. But let me come back to Azerbaijan and I just want to to mention one case uh, that has been has played a role in the whole uh, debate, but I will repeat it because for me personally it's, it's very important. It's the case of uh, Anna Mamaki. I say it because he was the one who gave me the opportunity to make this report on behalf of the situation in Azerbaijan. He came here to Berlin, uh, I'd say two or three years ago, and he was financed not by the Council of Europe, to have wrong ideas, not the Council of Europe supported him to come here, but there was some uh, civil society organizations who made it possible. And he came with a lot of documents. On many, many documented cases I had to, to observe and I had to, to make this list with alleged political prisoners. That is was my, uh, what, what I said. And he stayed here for three days and all day and all night we, uh, we were sitting together and checking all this list, all these documents, and then now he is arrested. I feel it's also personally for me, it's a, it's a kind of, of a thing I, I and we all together should not accept. We have, we have uh, commented and we have um, uh, <coughs> the, the whole process against it. There were 21 um, witnesses that he had frauded some people, that he did spent money uh, for, for any purpose that was not given in, in order. Twenty of this, uh, the victims said, no, everything is okay, everything what we gave him as a demand, he, he did and he got the money, it was completely correct. There was one case who said, yes, he is a bad man, but I cannot remember what was really going on. And this was uh, the only case, uh, he was um, a little bit in a, in a bad situation, but Nobody, nobody of the objective observers of this process said he had to be, he could be prisoned for five years and a half. And I think I just want to say it because it's personally uh, for me also a very, very uh, bad situation and I just wanted to mention it. Another point is um, what, can, what can we do, what can politics do, what can civil society do? My first impression when I, when I got this, this um, report on political prisoners of Azerbaijan, the uh, exact title was Follow up on the, political, on the situation of political prisoners in Azerbaijan. I, I was not the first to make this report. We had some, some basics from 2002, 2004, and we had a definition, and this was my event, and I started to work. And then there came these this cases where you see uh, the real face of, of what is going on and what character has such a government. Three times I asked for a meeting. 
Rita. And they gave me an answer. The first time they, they told me, yes, you are a nice guy. We like to see you in Azerbaijan. We have a lot of beautiful uh, beaches. You can go there and we can discuss and we spend you all the whole uh, week. And I said, yes, of course, I will come to Azerbaijan, but only to fulfill my, my job. My job as a rapporteur on political prisoners in this country. And then they said, no, you can't come because we have no political prisoners. And then this was the end of all debate with uh, the, the Azerbaijan government, uh, uh, embassy here in Berlin, and with the Azerbaijan government, uh, really. And then, and this is what I want to point out, what is, is the, the question also for the future. Uh, Michael McNamara mentioned that there was a meeting of the Bureau in Azerbaijan, in Baku, to present the ideas of the, the presidency of Azerbaijan for the next six, six months. And he said there was a rejected uh, the reason for a colleague from France and uh, René Rouquet and it was said he had no allowance to come to Azerbaijan. And what was the reaction of the officials of the Council of Europe? What was the reaction? The only thing I heard is that in the next two years there may be no meeting of any committee of the pace in Azerbaijan. This is all. And I think if this is the reaction of this old, 60 years old organization that stands as no other organization for democracy, for rule of law, for um, human rights, if that is, that is the only reaction. I do not know which way this organization will go in the future when there are every government who says we don't want to accept a mandate, we don't want to accept a member, an elected member of the, the institution of, of the Council of Europe, we will reject him to come to the country. I think this is, and therefore I think it's, it's really, really important. The decision which way the Council of Europe will go, not only, I say it very, very clear, not only in the direction of Azerbaijan, but especially in what its task to save human rights in the member states, this decision will come in the next year. And I do not know if, if, in which way this um, decision will go. I just remember one, and then I, I don't want to come back to this debate in the, in the Parliamentary Assembly about this, this, uh, um, uh, this report on the situation in Azerbaijan. One colleague, one delegate from, not from Azerbaijan, from a Western country, I remember very, very good, told me in this debate, what is that what you are doing? How can you write a report on the situation in a country you have never been? This was a question to me, and I only could answer this, you are the, the persons, you are the people who got that I could go to this country. And though I would go to the country, I have a lot of information to make this report, and this shows in, in which way this instrument of the Council of Europe is instrumentalized for political interests that have never been in the, in the basics of the Council of Europe. And this is what I want to, uh, to, to discuss for the, for the next future. I want, and I think we have good friends who, who go, will go this, this way, uh, together with it. I will uh, reach a situation the Council of Europe can do this job. That every rapporteur for any question of any uh, um, violation of human rights can do his job. And that he gets a fair chance to make a report and to discuss it in the political level that is not uh, biased by any proposals for Erdogan or what. This is, uh, I think, we have to, to, look, for, to look for and once again. It is not only the situation in Azerbaijan. We discussed about the situation in Russia. It is had to discuss about the situation, as I say very clearly, what I saw in the last, last weeks about the development in Turkey. It's not what I say. There are values, democratic values of the European Convention of Human Rights fulfilled. And this is what we have to say, and always very clearly, very frankly, and this is what every government in the Council of Europe has to do. This is what, why I understand my job, to go to this and 
this is my, my last sentence. We only, we, the Western countries, and all the countries and all the members of the Council of Europe who are in favor of such a direction, must prove that they are credible. And this means we all, we have to accept with an open debate about the human rights situation in all member countries of the Council of Europe, in our own countries, but also nobody has the right to say we deny that other delegates, elected delegates from the committees of the Council of Europe are denied to enter the country where they have to make their, uh, their job. This is what I feel is the next, must, must be the next steps, and therefore I really enjoy very much that this conference is here because I hope you have some proposals that will be discussed tomorrow. If there are some proposals to bring, it, bring us on this way to save these values that are in the 60 years for all the members of the Council of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Schwester, for, for this uh, appeal to do things and also this promise that uh, the Human Rights Commission of the German government is certainly going to pay close attention to this. We will discuss all these ideas further and perhaps what the speaker said before, a, a democratic international might emerge. Because there are other countries, I've had discussions with uh, governments, or parliamentarians in Europe, who also feel that uh, this is a real crisis that their institutions are, uh, our institutions are taking away from us. Uh, so we've had a lot of concrete proposals here. Uh, about from helping uh, political prisoners that are left largely without help at the moment to uh, how to clearly identify who needs this help uh, to uh, setting up structures that can work more effectively not just repeating uh, structures that have proven too weak and to not have enough resources to targeting the real interests from visa bans to uh, asset freezes uh, to shaming uh, people who are uh, supporting autocrats uh, and above all else to keep this issue alive to remind ourselves of the faces that we've talked about because in the end this is probably the most important task uh, we have uh, and now it's because of a civil society uh, not to forget the individuals because in the end this crisis has also erupted and gone so bad because so few think tanks and so few media uh, and so few parliaments uh, have paid attention if we would have listened to the debates in the Council of Europe in the last three years, we might have been warned about some things that happened later, and that made headlines in Russia and in Turkey and in Ukraine and elsewhere. So it would have been the trip wire to warn us, uh, but very few people paid attention. And, and I, want to, uh, I want to reiterate the timing. The timing is now. While Russian delegation has lost its voting rights in Council, in Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe. It is time to come back to the political prisoners issue and to highlight it because it's Russia who helps all the groups from post-Soviet uh, countries to imprison decent people. It's Russia who helps them, who helps them to do that. And it's time, time is now, while Russia is out of voting because the 80 Russian members uh, lost their voting rights, not over human rights, but over Ukraine, which is very, very important. But there's another decision coming up in a few weeks, and I think we should try to make this also an occasion for debate. There will be a new general secretary elected from the Council of Europe. And I think all the candidates should be asked by media, by civil society, what they promise to do about, about this crisis. You know, there will be an election in a few weeks' time. So, if, if uh, Russia was mentioned, I just want to, to add uh, one small uh, meeting during my, my, um, my reports. When I only had the report on the, uh, the situation of political prisoners in Azerbaijan, I had a good cooperation with the Russian delegation. They told me, we don't know if we are in favor, but we will not stay. And this was the argument that we had a good chance to win. And then came the second, the second mandate that was only the definition of the question of political prison. And then there was a big change in the Russian delegation. They came to me and said, OK, we told you if you only go on the situation in Azerbaijan, maybe we support you. But now, if you have the mandate to make this definition for political prisoners, 
can't support you anymore and they didn't mention but I edit for me because we might be the next country where it's to check. This is one of the situations we just now have in the Council of Europe and I think, think once again it's a very, very um, dangerous event. I just wanted to add one uh, housekeeping point to my, my little talk that there's uh, in, in the back of the room on the side table there's, there's a, uh, a number of books that we brought along called Why Europe Needs a Magnitsky Act, which is uh, a collection of essays from some of the most famous human rights activists around the world, including a number of uh, people who are here today. Uh, so the copies are there for you to grab and take and read. And I also want to point out there's a very good website on Justice for Second Magnitsky. Uh, there is a very interesting debate which took place a few weeks ago in Oslo on the website of the Norwegian Helsinki Committee with very good presentations uh, by former political prisoners, including the activists of Pussy Riot, Sona Brava. Um, there will be a lot more material available on our website, the ESI website. Um, and after this meeting, it was meant to be academic, which is meant to bring activists together to discuss what to do next. Um, we will continue the debate. Um, yes. what, what will you be able to do in the Council of Europe? Um, I think that's something we can discuss tomorrow. But this is one point. Um, I'd like to make, and that's that, you know, any criticism that I've made of Azerbaijan isn't a criticism of a governing party in Azerbaijan, it's a state of violations of human rights committed by and in the name of the state. And I mean, if we, I think that, you know, at, at previous sessions of the Council of Europe, um, Magnitsky has come up and will hopefully come up again in the future, there's a, a draft uh, resolution. But there's you know, I do want to restore balance. Um, Snowden also addressed the Council of Europe and addressed it from uh, Moscow because he couldn't come through any Western European state. Because if he did, he would have been uh, uh, seized and extradited to Washington. I mean, we should, I think, bear that in mind. We shouldn't start to pretend that somehow former Soviet states are uh, sort of their big dragons. And, Young men to young Europeans 
Uh, we've just spent 16 months in a jail in Azerbaijan, sentenced for hooliganism. Uh, so in a sense, what I would like with this conference is to begin with the end, or rather with what many of us hoped at the time uh, would be the end. And it is unfortunate that, in fact, we were wrong.
that we can solve the problems of political prisoners all over the countries of the Council of Europe. This is why I was together with Gerald Knaus and with ESI ready to do this and the concrete reason of course to you know is that since some days Azerbaijan now has the presidency of the Council of Europe. And this is uh, for us a very big issue and this is that we have to ask us and especially the colleagues who are engaged in the Council of Europe what are the conditions for the next six months, what can we demand on the new presidency of Azerbaijan? We just know that some days ago, one of the most popular human rights activists was uh, judged for a, a prison for five years and a half. On the 22nd of May, the, Council, uh, the, the European Human Rights Law Court has decided that the trial against another human rights activist in Azerbaijan was illegal and these are some basis we have to ask ourselves what are our demands to the presidency for the Council of Europe. And therefore, once again, I welcome you very, very warmly here in Berlin and I hope we will have some very interesting debates, some very interesting decisions and we can go up in this question that we can say at any time, not so far away in the future, that we have not to ask a, a Europe without political prisoners, but that we can say there is a Europe without political prisoners. And therefore, I thank you very much for coming here. I thank, thank very, very much to Gerald Knaus, who has the birth of totalitarian language abuse, of capturing the vocabulary of human rights. He said that in the year 2050, we might all live in Oceania, and the language of Oceania would be new speak where autocracy would be democracy and democracy autocracy, where black is white and white is black, where stolen elections and free and fair elections mean the same thing, where political prisoners are criminals and dissidents are hooligans. Well, this is actually what happened, this capture of language, at the beginning of last year in Strasbourg. The Council of Europe, one of the most respected institutions in the defense of human rights, set up on the foundation of the European Convention of Human Rights, had a vote. And this was the result, 125 to 79. It was a historic vote. Never in the history of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe have more people turned up to vote. So what was it that mobilized everybody to come? Well, it was to defeat this resolution. As there is a resolution drafted by the rapporteur of political prisoners, Christoph Stresser, who is here with us. A resolution which outlined these things, review old cases, ensure there are no new cases of political prisoners, refrain from prosecuting participants in peaceful demonstrations, refrain from criminalizing the expression of political and religious views. Why would anybody, why would an institution created as a spiritual union of democracies reject such a resolution? <coughs> But first, who defeated it? Here is a breakdown. All 18 Russian members turned up and voted against this resolution. All 10 Turks, all 9 Spaniards, all 9 Italians, a majority of Ukrainians from Yanukovych, which is part of the regions, and a majority from the United Kingdom, all from the Conservative Party, and from France. Those who lost and who voted for this resolution were all 11 German members, all 6 Swedes, all members of the Baltic states, most Swiss, Finns, and Norwegians. Why? I won't go into it here. We wrote a report on this, which you can find on the website. Let me talk here rather about the what followed after. The first reaction was by the Azerbaijani head of the delegation to that assembly. This is what he said. The rapporteur, Mr. Stresser, has to accept that the Council of Europe belongs to Azerbaijan and not to him. What followed was a wave of arrests. Not all votes in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe have consequences. This one did. From March onwards, there was a wave of arrests like this one of Rashadat Akunov, a youth activist, and many others. But what was interesting was from now on, these arrests were carried out without any sense of shame. The prisoner carousel, where people would be arrested and then released when there was enough pressure, as in the case of Emin Milian and Adnan Hajizadeh, who we had at the very beginning. This prisoner carousel stopped turning. 
In fact, now people were arrested and sentenced no longer to two years, but to five, six, eight years in prison. And it also, the focus changed of who was targeted. The regime in Azerbaijan no longer cared about arresting people who actually worked for the Council of Europe. Look at these two individuals. Ilgan Mamadov, an opposition politician, was also the head of the School of Politics, a Council of Europe project to promote democracy. By arresting him a few weeks after this resolution was defeated, the regime sent a very strong signal of what it meant that the Council of Europe now belongs to Azerbaijan. What petition uh, you made? We want to thank students, staff and faculty of University of Richmond. Professors, staff and students of Europe Institute in Germany and Columbia University, Central European University and all other students across Europe and across the world who chipped in and gave their talents for our liberation. Essence University. Also, also so many universities. It's impossible to uh, be yeah. Americans, the Azerbaijani Americans for Democracy Organization in Washington, D.C. All journalists and bloggers who were brave enough to cover our case. And not just journalists or bloggers, like everyone on the internet who was writing some posts, some uh, demands, uh, you know, clicking, spreading, sharing information about injustice, who organized petitions, who did protests, who got jailed, harassed, detained, or arrested in this time. We want to thank every single one of you, all of you together, for doing all this from all your heart. We felt the warmth of your heart in our cell. Every single person who donated books and other materials, send us journals, newspapers, who just stood with us both physically and morally in these difficult times. Thank you for being with us in a very hard time. Every single one of you played a huge role in our liberation. Your actions were brave, sincere, swift and to the point. And hence, we are free right now. We hope that someday we'll live in a society where campaigns of this sort are unnecessary. But until then, we encourage you to stay strong, to stick with your beliefs. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what we just saw here is in many ways a very familiar story. Nonviolent critics of an authoritarian regime, thugs sent to beat them up one day in a restaurant, fake charges in the court to put them in prison, an international mobilization on their behalf, an effort to shame the regime that put such critics in jail, and in the end, they are set free. For those who lost 60 months of freedom in jail, there will always, this will always remain a sad story. And it will always remain bitter memories for friends, relatives and compatriots who were supposed to be intimidated. But in a strange way, this particular story is also reassuring. Because our mechanisms worked. Shaming worked. It is clear what is right and wrong. And in the end, right prevailed. In 1961, an article appeared in the London Observer. It launched a movement that has transformed the world. And that is still with us, the International Human Rights Movement. In this article, the author argued that there is a growing tendency across the world to disguise the real reasons upon which non-conformists are put in jail. And he wrote that this indicates that governments are by no means indifferent to the pressure of outside opinion. And that when opinion is concentrated 
on one weak spot, it can sometimes succeed in making a government relent. Now the morality behind that article and this campaign which it launched was that every individual counts. The strategy was to make individuals known, to shame regimes, and its symbol became a lit candle. And the organization that grew out of this, which obtained the Nobel Peace Prize 15 years later, of course was Amnesty International. In the 1970s, we entered the age of dissent, the age of Soviet and Central European dissidents. It was also the age of the Helsinki Final Act of Human Rights, about which the US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger famously said, its human rights provisions might as well be written in Swahili for all I care. He was a realist. What did these words on paper really mean? But dissidents and Helsinki watch groups disagreed. They were created all across the Soviet Union and Central Europe. Charter 77, Václav Havel, a playwright, took the lead. And so new words appeared. Non-violence, resistance, living in truth, the power of the powerless. Helsinki watch groups led to Human Rights Watch. And one of its founders explained that it is necessary to also challenge those who indirectly support human rights abuse to mobilize against the financial, political, and military backing, to focus on what he called the surrogate villains. And so a movement grew. Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Reporters Without Borders, we've just seen the list, and many more. And today we have more human rights groups than ever, more conventions than ever, more human rights commissioners than ever. And we have the story of a great success, as Václav Havel himself put it later, the story of stubborn men who knocked their head against the wall and then the wall falls, and these men are crowned kings. It is the fairy tale story of the end of the Iron Curtain, when this man, released from prison in January 1989, becomes president in December, and others, Arpad Gönz in Hungary, Bronislav Geremek in Poland, and of course the story of Nelson Mandela, political prisoners who leave prison to become moral leaders in the transition in their countries. But here is the problem. Never trust in progress to be irreversible. The Inquisition was abolished centuries ago. So was torture. So was slavery. But they all came back in the 20th century, in Europe, in this city. And across town, there are museums, the topography of terror, museums to the wall, museums to communist repression. Nothing can ever be taken for granted. And so now, in the 21st century, we see the return of political prisoners back in Europe. Amnesty International counts today around 40 prisoners of conscience in Europe. Almost half of them are in one country in Azerbaijan, then in Belarus, then in Russia, until recently in Ukraine. The problem has been spreading. George Orwell wrote in 1984 about the dangers